Have you ever wanted somebody to talk to? <laughs> you're having a struggle and you're thinking, man, who, who can I talk to about this? Or specifically this morning, they, they just intimidate me. Who, who can help me? That's, that's where this text leads. If you want to turn to Matthew 10, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 24, page 815, the black pew Bibles. Matthew 10, 24. I, I was reading and studying, preparing this week, and one of these old hymns came to mind, so I asked that we sing it for the invitation at the close of the service. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus. And we're picking up the text here in Matthew 10, 24, and Jesus will be saying to us, says, I hear you, and especially when it comes to a struggle with how the world reacts to your faith. If you run into some people who are commenting negatively because you posted something Christian or you have a faith viewpoint, the Matthew 10, just verses 24 and 25, a student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. And first things first, you may have Beelzebub, Beelzebul, Satan. It's something for the devil, the chief of the evil servants. I think the message has dung face. I think it's the word that they use there. And I don't know what names you may have been called, if any, because of your faith. But Jesus is right there. He is the head of the household. Uh, that's where we start on the blanks. Jesus, Jesus certainly understands. He appreciates any grief you ever get for being Christian. And, and one of the variations on the hymn lyrics, uh, they added a verse that, that's not in our hymnal. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, he all my cares and sorrows will share. Well, he'll share it because he's already been there. This, this whole thing about not being accepted or, or not being appreciated by the culture. Jesus, Jesus gets it. You know? uh, on, on multiple levels, Jesus, Jesus ran afoul of the religious leaders and the authorities. He fought with them on many an occasion. Jesus knows how it feels. If you have somebody that comes and they're kind of like, oh, we, we have to protect the institutions from people like you and we can't have your version of spirituality. Jesus knows what that feels like. He had these vast crowds that loved him when he was doing stuff for them. When he was healing people and he's handing out food, oh, multitudes everywhere. But the minute he starts teaching about sacrifice or discipleship, the crowd would thin. Jesus knows how that feels to, to be, shall we say, used and abused or admired and then ignored. Jesus, he, he had these disciples. He had these 12 guys who mean well most of the time. <laughs> they, they tried so hard to understand most of the time. You know? But they had their questions, their confusion, they misunderstood stuff. Jesus knows how it feels. If you find yourself, you're, you're basically looking around the room and thinking, is there anybody here who really understands how I feel or what we are wrestling with? You know, I, I want to share my life. I wish I could share this hurt with my friends, but they just don't get it. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus gets it. He says, hey, look, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If you're going to be connected to Jesus, you might as well expect that some people are going to want to treat us just like they treated him. These are Paul's words to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Be honest, how many, how many weeks did I start out like that? Oh, I want to share in Jesus' suffering this week. And I know school's out for just, I think, everybody now, but how many students can you know, you're going to school in the morning, boy, I hope I just really suffer for being a Christian today. I, I don't know that we, I know we don't say it. I don't think that way. But how many times has somebody made a comment about you because you're a Christian kid? Oh, they might not say it to your face. You know, they might not call you straight up the devil, you know, but they whisper it behind your back. 
because of things you choose to do or not to do, or you don't go along with the crowd. You know? And what this hurts even worse is you know you're the one that's not making the bad choice. You know? it, is, it is bad enough to be mocked or called a name, but it's even worse when you're made fun of and you made the healthy choice or you're making the godly decision. And we're going to put up Isaiah 5.20. We've used it several times. Um, this is a good verse to talk about memorization. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you're going to memorize that, it has all the bad ones first. You know, the evil, the darkness, the bitter, the bad part always comes first. We're going to reference that. That's, that's important. <laughs> Remember that. Recall that. You know, if somebody's out there saying it's good, but you know it's bad, stick to your guns. If they're telling you it's the right thing, oh, that's light, but you know it's darkness, hold your ground. You know, one, one of my sources this week said, Christians are everyday people who are called to advance the kingdom of God in an alien and hostile world. And this is what happens in church. You sit in a pew, you say, okay, I hear you, That's, that sounds fine now. I'm sitting here surrounded by all my Christian friends. But what do you have for me? Better yet, what does Jesus have for me midweek when they're at me again, Wednesday or Thursday? So listen for the do not be afraid. In, in these next few verses... Because Jesus knows one of the devil's primary tools is fear. I'm afraid that they won't like me. If he can make us afraid that we might lose our job. Afraid that friends or family are going to mock us. Listen, he'll, he'll give you three reasons not to be afraid. Uh, verse 26. Matthew 10, 26. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Did you, did you hear him? Can you, somebody can say, yeah, I can fill out all the blanks now. Can I leave? No. <laughs> Stay here. You know, that idea. Always, <clears throat> I'll always listen. There are three reasons here that Jesus gives three reasons to not be afraid, and I'm indebted to Michael Wilkins in the NIV application. He gave us these three. And the first one that I would write is, the truth about Christianity will become known. It's going to be made known. Always keep that in mind. There's going to come a day when the truth of the Bible, the truth of the gospel, the message about Jesus, it's going to be clear to everybody. We might have to wait for it, but it's going to happen. And Jesus may have had to kind of start this whole enterprise a little bit in secrecy. You know, there are times when he says, don't, t don't go telling everybody this. Because he understood uh, the timetable. He would explain to the disciples in private tutoring sessions, you know, what I tell you in the dark, what's whispered in your ears. He knew that the people are going to misunderstand this. The religious establishment is going to see him as a threat. But all that's gone now. All that, that initial containment, the initial threat, we're not, you're not in danger of exposing Jesus to the world. They already know him, you know. That part's done. This is the promise of Jesus. What is hidden, good and bad, will be disclosed. Their motive will be exposed in the end. Verse 26, I don't know where you stand on all things political. I know we all need to be involved. We need to be aware. Certainly need to be praying. It's this motive thing. That's for me. I look at Washington. I, that's, what is your motive? Every time somebody says, are you, you really saying that? You're really doing that because you think that's for the good of the country? Or you have a different motive for the good of the party or your pocketbook. You know? it, the thing that keeps us encouraged with our faith is, is one day everybody's motive is going to be exposed. Everybody is going to see Jesus as Lord. This is Philippians 2, several from Philippians uh, this week. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Revelation takes it even further. Chapter 6, 15, 17. Uh, 
Some of these people who are mocking the faith right now, teasing you at work and school, when they see the reality, these are the verses. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich and the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? And, and some of the struggle in this, and this one for us is, is what? Okay, that's great for eternity. I hear what you're saying. How's that going to help me tomorrow? I, come on, God, just, just one lightning bolt would really help me. You know, like, don't kill them. You know, just like frazzle their hair. Just so, you know. if you, Lord, if you would just blow the phone out of their hand. And when they pick that thing up, it's smoking, you know, and you got, they got a little text message that said, she is one of mine, knock it off. You know, just one time. And, and I, I feel that way. I sing, we're going to sing verse 2 of this hymn, and it's going to say, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly an end. And I sing that, and I think, oh, sometimes it's not as quickly as I would like it to happen. But it's going to come. So you mark it down that there will be a day when the truth of Christianity will be crystal clear to the whole world. So verse 27, Jesus says, you can shout that from the rooftops. And somebody, there's an objection. It, they had an objection then, and they might have it today. If I say that, it could cost me my life. And the answer is, yeah, it might. But that's where their power will end. The second one that Jesus had, don't be afraid. Our eternal destiny still has it, regardless. The message translation here. Don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open. And everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. In verse 28, you could lose your life for this. I'm not going to skip over that. I'm not going to lessen that. It's the truth. I, I just had a picture of Martin Burnham on the screen last week. Man died because of his faith, being a missionary. Um, we always quote, quote Jim Elliott. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And we know that he lost his life serving as a missionary. Every time I quote that, yeah, that guy died. I know. Both those guys died. For the Christian, physical life on earth is not the final, greatest, top prize. Now, having said that, I appreciate life. I like being alive. You know, I do. But my eternal destiny is still in heaven. It does not matter the length of my years here. Philippians 3.17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their minds are on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Don't, don't ever lose sight of that transition. And, and, and the older we get, you know, body breaks down, the more we look forward to that. But I'm saying even to the young people today, I don't care. Even when you're healthy and fit and as strong as you are today, that's a blessing, but eternity is still going to be better. You know? there, there, there's going to be a day. So we, we just have to keep, what's the term, pounding this drum. You just keep reminding people. I don't, you get those seasons, I've had them, you know, it's just, oh, it's another day. And you get up, it's another day. And it's the same stuff. Different day. I, I read an article this week, USA Today, about major league baseball players, specifically the ones that are already on the losing teams. I think they said like a quarter of the season or more is in the books, and some of the teams pretty much know where they stand down here, and they still have to play like a hundred games. And the whole article was, how, how do you keep it up? It said one team lost 12 out of their last 13, and they play in stadiums that look like these. I found a couple pictures of sparse crowds. And, and the whole article is about, man, how do, you, how do you keep going? They aim at finding meaning in the inconsequence. Now, so you've got two teams that are playing a game has no playoff implications. It's inconsequential. <laughs> and and, and if, if you're like me, you know, initially you're looking at a ball player. How do you keep going? Well, you get paid a million dollars. 
You know, that's how you keep going. You get to eat out in a different city every night. That's how you keep going. But we all know that. We all know money. How much money? It's not going to buy happiness. We know that. And I'm going to venture that even eating out, if you do it enough times in a row, you get sick of it. That, that's not going to do it. If we're not careful, if, if we don't keep our eyes focused on, on the end goal, the greatness of eternity, it's easy to get swallowed up and discouraged by this just daily grind. You start thinking, well, this day is inconsequential. We're just like the ball players. Today doesn't matter. You know, I'm not even making a million dollars. And I'm cooking my own food. You know? not a, never forget what heaven is. Don't let them get us down. Adjust your focus. See eternity. Heaven's going to be great. It's going to be more than worth all of this. This life is just a fleeting moment. Don't give up. 2 Timothy 4, 4 and 5. Preach the word. Do your work. This is for all of us, no, no matter the cultural temperature. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And when you're done with that, be in heaven. And then the, the third do not be afraid from the text is that we, these are big words, we all enjoy our Father's unrelenting, sovereign supervision. You can either write all that or just say, Dad will take care of you. Okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Hunter to put up a clip. Uh, there's, there's really no sound needed for this, but just w- watch this little kid. He'll come on there in a second. Have you seen this? On his little scooter or whatever. Look how long it goes, and it'll get worse. I didn't even count how many cars pass him. I did see the bus. <laughs> When's it going to stop? Finally, somebody comes out. Parental supervision, or lack thereof. Can't imagine. Uh, the, the, the number of deaths from children left in hot cars. Kidsincars.org, last year, 2018. 52. One in Zanesville. One month old little baby boy. So comparatively speaking, I would trust that every family in the room is feeling a little better about our parenting. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was all set to stand here and say, I've never left a child in the car. <laughs> And my wife would say, yes, and you've let them cross the street when they were 18 months old. You let one drive a van into the creek right there when he was two. <laughs> if you haven't heard those stories, ask me later. Um, you don't have to ask Derek because actually both of them involve his brother. <laughs> and Brandon's sitting right there. He's alive, so I don't want to hear any grief. Okay? Uh-huh. But, but, but that, I mean, that's my point. I'm, I'm, like Mark said, far from a perfect father as well. I think everybody in this room is pretty glad that you don't have to depend on me solely 24-7. But Jesus' words here, 29 and 30, do not be afraid. Your heavenly Father is always aware. And he does a perfect job. And I, I don't care who says what about you this week. God loves you this much. He puts this much value on you. And Jesus has the, the little bird illustration, the birds for sale. And in here in the text, there are two for a penny. And if you look in the, and I think it's a Luke account, they're five for two pennies. So it's like buy four, get one free. You know, they just get cheaper as the numbers go higher with the sparrows. And, and even today, sparrows just, I don't know, they're just, they're not worth a whole lot to us. But God knows every one of them what happens in their little feathered lives. You know, every time I fill the bird feeder out back and I look out, oh, there's a cardinal. Yeah, a blue jay. Did you see that goldfinch? Oh, sparrows, 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 sparrows. I, look, I looked out this morning, we counted eight sparrows. You know, there's more sparrows, always sparrows. Oh. This reminds me, God loves me so much. And, and the hair counting, and we always have a bald guy joke, 
You know, for, for me, it's that little, I, I call it the hair donut that ends up in the trash can in the bathroom. She has this big brush, and she scrapes it out, and it, it makes a perfect little donut every time. And it sits in there, and there must be 2,000 hairs in that thing. I don't know exactly, but God does. And Jesus' words, don't be afraid. Remember how much you're worth to God. Philippians 4.19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Don't be afraid. God knows. He cares. He, he will provide. He'll bring you safely home. It doesn't matter who says what about you and your faith this week. We speak boldly for Jesus. Verse 32, Jesus says, you stand for me here. I will stand for you there in heaven. Is that a fair deal? You know, what, what, what do some of us say when we're driving around central Ohio and you pass that random house that's flying a blue flag with a big yellow M right in the middle of it? You know, idiots. That's what, no. <laughs> but you've you got to respect their willingness, right, to be, <laughs> they're going to take that stand in, in this neck of the woods. Am I that bold with my faith? You know, I, do, I remember taking Derek to, to watch the Green Bay Packers play in Cincinnati, home of the orange and black, all right? And here's this kid all decked out in green and gold, <laughs> cheese. You know, I'm like, oh dear, <laughs> are we going to survive? You know, but am I that bold for Jesus? And we all have the stuff. The, we have car decals. We make jackets. There are cups you can carry around. You know, countless ways to acknowledge Jesus before the society. A am I bold? It it's a given that this culture will at times be anti-Jesus. That's putting it mildly. Okay? It's a reality that all of us have the potential that we're going to encounter somebody this week who opposes the gospel, maybe violently. And the question that we're trying to answer and address is, am I going to be afraid of that opposition? You know, Jesus knows what it feels like. He, he can certainly relate. You can talk to him about it any time. And when you do, he, he's going to give you some reasons to not be afraid. These three and others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for reminders and encouragements. You know our lives. You know our culture. You know what we face. Uh, you know how it feels uh, to be gathered here together and how it feels when we're out isolated and alone. Remind us that we are never alone. We have our friends. Uh, we have our Father. Remind us of what awaits all of us, really how, how quickly the marbles pass and we face eternity. Uh, Father, we are grateful for the example of our Lord. May we draw near to him this week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We will always continue to encourage you. Maybe today is the day that you know you need to Step up boldly and give your life to him to be immersed. Uh, the invitation, as we said, I must tell Jesus. Let's stand together.
he can stay this morning, come back tonight. I'll check with Daniel here in a minute. Several things from the bulletin and elsewhere. Um, announcement after church. Let Diane Harvey know today if you are or are not planning to attend uh, for those who worked on the mulch and the weeding and such. She's going to have a luncheon for them uh, next Sunday, so please let Diane know on that one. And you can see several things through the bulletin. Uh, we, we have a float that we built for the summer, and you'll notice a picture of Carly in there, and you'll notice a picture of Amy on the back. I realize that sometimes you may not always know these people I tell you to go see. And I'm just telling anybody that uses social media, I consider all that fair game. <laughs> so if you post a picture, I feel like I'm able to use that in the bulletin. So just be, be aware that I can match up faces sometimes, and, and that's what I did. So the Father's Day cookout is one. Like if you've already, if you sign up for some things online, you don't need to do it in the foyer. It's, it's one or the other. You know, if you've already signed up digitally for Vacation Bible School, that's great. Um, if you haven't, then yeah, check maybe, you know, with one of us. Uh, same thing with the top dog competition. If you want to be in that, you can tell me. You guys can just tell me, text me, email me, because I know what division you're in. You know, one online, there is one on the website. You could use the official form because it has the age divisions, but I know everybody here, whether you're boy or girl, man or man or woman. So. But those things are coming up June 15th, graduates next Sunday. If you would like to be one of the people, we will ask folks to come on stage and pray for and over our graduates. So if you would like to be one of those folks, just let me know, and, and we'll have everybody matched up for that. I don't think there's anything else. Daniel, anything for high school, middle school? Uh, just uh, youth group tonight, as as usual, uh, seven o'clock. I cannot wait to see you students there. Uh, I've got lots of stuff that's uh, planned, and it'll be lots of fun. So, uh, other than that, very good. Did you pray for us? Yep. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I just wanted to thank you, uh, God. You love us constantly. Uh, you know each and every one of us by name, and it is amazing and it is wonderful and it is beautiful. God, thank you so much for showing us how to love. And God, as, as we look at the way that you love us, help us remember that we are called to do the same. We are called to love others in a way that you love us. God, help us remember that, that no matter what, we're called to show others who you are. And as we do that, we're called to love them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's close this morning. We sing the Lord. Here, here.